cut in the front so that uh, we won't have to introduce them again. Okay. Okay, here we go. In 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. Welcome. Welcome. We're glad that you joined us. We're talking about Islam and Christianity tonight. We have four guests that are ready to speak to you and present their positions. And the first topic that we're going to take a look at is what does the word God mean to both Christianity and Islam? You know, today the word of God or the word God is one of the most widely used but vague and undefined terms in our language. People like Einstein define God as a pure mathematical mind. There are others today that are making movies and saying that God's a force. There's a lot of people that are urging us to simply to agree to use the word God and not define it at all, lest we breed division. Well, it's obvious, however, that if God is, his existence and his nature do not depend on what anyone thinks about him. And if God's there, he's got to reveal to us what he's like. The book of Hebrews says it this way, God at sundry times and divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Both Islam and Christianity believe that. Where we disagree is in the words that follow and hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. But tonight, what are the differences concerning the concept of God for both Christianity and for Islam? Ultimately, if there are differences, we want to know how will they impact you in your belief? Because you're going to have to choose after you listen to these folks. Tonight, we're going to differ in our regular format and we're going to give five minutes to each side to present the evidence for their position on this topic, the concept of God, who is Allah, who is the God of the Bible. And we're going to start tonight with uh, Dr. Jamal Badawi, and we're going to ask that you would go right to the lectern and begin. Assalamu alaikum. It is a pleasure to participate in this overdue dialogue between Christians and their uh, Muslim brethren. Both are members of the same human family inhabiting the same global village. Both identify themselves with the Abrahamic ethical monotheism based on faith in the one and only true supreme creator, sustainer, and cherisher of the universe. God in English, Allah in Arabic, even though most Muslims are non-Arabs, and Dieu in French. There are at least three common beliefs that unite both communities of faith. <clears throat> First, the belief that God is not a myth, is not a dry or remote philosophical concept. God is not identical with the universe or nature that he created. God did not create the universe and retire and became inactive in history. God is not a despotic being who demands our obedience for his own benefit or enjoy tormenting and punishing his creation. Secondly, both communities believe that while the nature and essence of God is beyond our comprehension, we can relate to God's divine attributes. Some of these attributes relate to our personal intimate relationship with him, such as love, mercy, and forgiveness. Other attributes relate to God's majest majesty, transcendence, such as supremacy, creation, power, perfect knowledge and wisdom, pervading presence, justice, righteousness, and holiness. All these are mentioned in the Quran. Thirdly, <clears throat> both communities are united in the belief that faith in God is not a mere dry dogma, but an experience of closeness, trust, love, and willing submission to God. It should be a dynamic faith which gives life a meaning and direction. While these three common beliefs are very essential to the Muslim, however, oneness of God 
means more than believing in the one creator of the universe. There are three additional conditions. First, God is one in essence and in person. This excludes the presence of equal divine persons in the same Godhead. Neither tritheism nor trinity, however explained, is compatible with the pure Islamic monotheism. Two, God alone is worthy of worship and unqualified devotion. None is to be worshipped instead of him or alongside with him as co-equal, nor is God to be worshipped through any creature, whether religious institution, clergy, or even the greatest of the prophets. The third condition in Islam for monotheism is that any shortcoming, man-like weaknesses and limitation is not befitting to the glory of God. This excludes any notion of God incarnate and any other quality or action which is ungodly, ungodlike, or unsuitable for the majesty of God. <clears throat> to the Muslim, any deviation from any of these conditions is called in Arabic shirk means to associate or join others with God in his exclusive divine attributes. It is regarded as a serious compromise of pure and long-standing monotheism taught by all prophets. In fact, Muslims believe that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was sent by God to restore and clarify the same pure concept of monotheism that was taught by all of the prophets. Finally, a few examples of what the Quran says about God. God is forgiving, ghafoor, full of loving compassion, wadud in Arabic, close to mankind, qareeb. God begets not, nor was begotten, and there is nothing comparable unto him. God, there is no God but he, the living, the self-sustaining, the eternal, no slumber can seize him nor sleep. His are all things in heavens and on earth. And finally, God is the knower of the visible and the invisible, most gracious, most merciful, the sovereign, the holy one, the source of peace, the protector, and unto whom all submit in love and devotion. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. Dr. Gleason Archer, we're going to ask that you would uh, speak on behalf of Christianity concerning the concept of God. You begin right now. In the first place, we should observe that Islam and Christianity are closer to each other than to any other religions. And they share so much in the way of conviction concerning the sacredness of life and the ideals of marriage and family. And we do rejoice that so many who are of that background have come at last to a country like America where they have an opportunity to make a choice in regard to their understanding of God and their purpose in life, a choice which perhaps is far more open than would be in a Muslim country where it is a matter of death penalty if anyone ever leaves the Muslim faith. Now, the God who is presented in the Holy Scripture is not simply a sterile monad. He is a Trinitarian God who is observable immediately in Genesis the first book, the first chapter, and the first three verses. Because in the first verse, we are told that God, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. And then in the second verse, we're told that the Ruach Elohim, the Spirit of God, brooded over the waters in the initial stage of the earth's development. And then in the third verse, we are told that God said, let there be light. Well, Yomer Elohim Yehi Or. 
And this, of course, evokes the creative word of God, which is explained in the Gospel of John, the first chapter in the first three verses. In the beginning was the word, the logos, and the logos was with God, and the logos was God. All things came into being through the logos. Now it is true that in Deuteronomy verse, six, uh, verse 4 of chapter 6, we have that fine statement which was basic to the faith of Israel and I think basic also to Islam and Christianity. Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh our God, Yahweh is one. And uh, the term used for one, by the way, is echad, which is like the Arabic ahad, meaning one. But it's very interestingly used in Genesis 2.24 of what happens when man and wife become married. And they too shall become one flesh, basar echad. Well, of course, this does not mean that there's just a husband or just a wife, but the two of them are one. In the 26th verse of Genesis 1, we read in connection with God's creation of man, let us make man in our image. Now, this could not possibly refer to angels joining with God in the matter of furnishing a model for man. It does seem to imply a plurality on the part of the one God. Now, of course, it is true that in later times, certainly in Quranic times, the first person plural pronoun we was frequently used uh, in a majestic way. Uh, Allah is quoted uh, very often in this fashion. But the thing that is important to observe that in no ancient language of the BC period do you find such a usage. If a person means I, he says I, he does not say we. Therefore, on historic linguistic grounds, we are forced to say that uh, there is an implication of plurality in, God, in the Godhead in this account of man's creation. Now, it is also important to observe that it is a God with love and compassion for man. Okay. And we'll speak of that more later. All right. Thank you very much. And we're going to take a break. And when we come right on back, we're going to uh, have a little discussion further with our men. So stick with us. All right. We're going to take these uh, lecterns down. Everybody stand up and uh, change your position just for a moment while we take those down. And we're coming right back. All right, stand by. Okay, John. In ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, two. All right, we're back and. Uh, my first question is going to be to uh, Dr. Hussein Morrissey, and uh, my question is this. I'm going to read a passage from the Koran, and then I'm going to ask you a question. 
In the Quran, in Surah 547 through 51, it says, It was we who revealed the law, talking about the law of Moses, therein was guidance and light. By its standards have been judged the Jews, by the prophets, now we got the prophets, who bowed to God's will, by the rabbis and the doctors of the law, for to them was entrusted the protection of God's book. So the law and the prophets are said to be God's book. And in their footsteps, after that, we sent Jesus, the son of Mary, confirming the law, the Torah, that had come before him. We sent him the gospel. Therein was guidance and light. Let the people of the gospel judge by what God has revealed therein, the law, the prophets, the gospel. If any fail to judge by what God has revealed, they are no better than what? Rebels. To thee we sent the scripture in truth, that's the Quran, confirming the scripture that came before it, that's the Bible, and guarding it in safety. So judge between them by what God has revealed and do not follow their vain desires, diverging from the truth that has come to thee. Now, it's called truth. Now, if the Christian is to obey the teaching of the Quran, he's going to read the books of Moses, the law. He's going to read the prophets. He's going to listen to what Jesus said in the Gospels. He's going to listen to the apostles. And when he does that, he's going to find out that first, in 2 Peter 1.17, the Father is declared to be God, for he received honor and glory from God the Father. Second, the Son is declared to be God in John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Third, the Holy Spirit is declared to be God in Acts 5, 3, and 4. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you've lied to the Holy Spirit? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men, but to God. And finally, when you look at the prophets and you look at the law of Moses, Deuteronomy 6, 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You put all that together, the Christian says, God revealed it to us. He's the one who should know what he's like. And he said, in the Quran, it says, you were to look at that. You put them together. These three persons are the one God, whether we understand it or not. Why? Because he revealed it to us. There's only one God who manifests himself to us as three persons, the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. So Jesus and Matthew could say, Go and baptize in the name singular of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We don't understand it, but God has revealed it to us. How do you get around obeying that and not holding on to the concept of a triune God when the Koran points us right to that information? You know, uh, John, I'm very happy that you quoted from the Koran and you brought that specific verse in. What you are concluding here are theological doctrines that were never taught by Jesus, was never taught by Moses, was never taught by Abraham, was never taught by any of the uh, prophets. Now, you brought up multiple points that I would like to address them if I have the time one by one, but at least I will address the most important one for just the sake of uh, time. Nowhere does we mean Trinity. If we say me, we means plural. Anyone that's familiar with the Semitic language like the Hebrew and the Arabic will know that there is a plural of respect and there is a plural of number. The we and the us that's mentioned in the Old Testament and in the Quran refers to the plural of respect of God Almighty. Even the Queen of England, John, says we. It does not mean that there is multiple queens here. This is number one. Number two, if God is a triune God, then Jesus does not have to beat around the bush and does not have to rely on theologians. He does not have to rely on interpretation. He would have just came out when someone asked him, what is the first of all the commandments? He said, here, O Israel, the Lord our God is a triune God. Yet he did not. He said, here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. Therefore, you shall worship the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy strength and with all that thy spirit. This, in essence, is the core expression of faith in Islam. La ilaha illallah. There is no one to be worshipped but the one and only mighty God. Now let me remind you also, John, that Jesus, peace be upon him, put his forehead to the ground and prayed to God. And 
that Jesus referred to God Almighty as my Father, your Father, my God, and your God. So nowhere does it say that God is a triune. This is a byproduct of the theology of the Council of Nicaea. In the year 325, if you study the history of Christianity, okay. you'll find out that they said God is two, and then the second conference of Nicaea added number three to it. So this has nothing okay. to do Can with I Jesus. I one thing about your interpretation of the Bible, John, because I think there are two major mistakes. First of all, you're implying that the Bible confer the Quran confirms the Bible. Nowhere in the Quran does it confirm the Bible, never mentioned, or Old Testament, or New Testament, or Gospels in plural. What the Quran deal with is the Torah given to Moses, and that does not even include the Pentateuch, because the Pentateuch speaks about the death and burial of Moses. Okay. It speaks about God revealed, right. and what hold God on. revealed to Jesus. All right, hold on. We got, we got four on the table now. And let me go to the fellow I wrote, I was reading from here's Arabic translation, Dr. Gleason Archer. He says that your Arabic translation is no good. Yes, but it's uh, by Yusuf Ali. <laughs> I didn't explain it. I didn't, I didn't talk about translation. I was talking yeah. that nowhere okay. in the Quran, yeah. when the Quran used the term Torah, it is not equivalent to the Judeo-Christian term Torah. It's only the book that given to Moses. When the Quran revealed to the gospel, it doesn't use the plural. It revealed to the teaching of Jesus, not the words of Paul okay, or okay. Peter. Right. That let, me, let me ask one question to you, and then I'm going to come to these men because we got such short time. The verses that I was reading, Matthew 28, 19, 1 Peter and Acts, what is that literature? That literature is a combination of biography about Jesus by Matthew and statements of faith and belief by the other writers, not what the Quran teach about, which is the teaching of Jesus himself. Where we is, don't regard them as the same. Yeah, where is that teaching that you're talking about? Where is it? Can I, can I answer no, this? No, 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 just listen. <laughs> where is that teaching that you're talking that about? That teaching is partly included in the, in the uh, Gospels, partly lost, but the Quran, as you quoted yourself, keeping it in safety, that means the Quran came to confirm what remained intact. So our criterion as Muslims, that anything in the gospel that is consistent with the Quran, which is the last revelation and criterion, is regarded as the teaching of Jesus. All right. It is there, yes. All right, we got only four minutes left. So Gleason, there's four questions that have come up. Another, first of all, is the material that we were quoting, Matthew and Acts and Peter, is that not the gospels? Is that not from the eyewitnesses? How do we know that? Second, what about this plural we? Third is the fact of uh, Jesus talking about my God and your God. I think that's a good way to uh, bring it out because he did say my God and your God for a reason. Would you comment on those three things? Yes. Well, first of all, I uh, apparently did not communicate successfully to these gentlemen the fact that there is no recorded use in right. any ancient language in the B.C. period or in the classical Roman or Greek uh, period where the pronoun we is ever equivalent to I. Right. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the only honest thing you can do in the interpretation of language is to recognize the fact that when the Hebrew used nase, let us make, it was talking about more than one. <laughs> Secondly, the term injil is to be uh, applied certainly to the first four Gospels, each one of which was an Evangelium. It is only fair, John, at this point, to ask Dr. Gleason Archer, does we mean Trinity? If he is denying we is the plural of respect in ancient language, can he tell us that in ancient language or in English, we means Trinity? No, we'll, we'll ask him because it he's the authority. It means plurality. Plurality. So plurality, you're talking yes. about multiple gods then. You mean all, no, the Jews no, were not aware, all, right. all the Jews were not aware of okay, their own let, language? Let, let, let Gleason answer the <laughs> question. Gleason? The, this is a misunderstanding on the part of uh, the Arab thinking that really should be corrected. That's right. You see, if you say, uh, as is declared in the 112th surah, Lem Yelid wa Lem Yulad, he did not beget and he was not begotten, we'd have to agree with you because that term implies that first there was God the Father and then later God the Son. We do not believe that. In other words, what we have in Scripture is a presentation of God who eternally obsisted, uh, consisted in three hypostases or persons, if you like to use that term, just as an electrical battery 
consists of a positive plane, a uh, positive pole and a negative pole. Okay, it would be Jesus a mistake to say that uh, you cannot have a battery unless it just has one pole. There are some things that are inherently compound. Okay. Let so, me wait, say wait. this, please, John. Okay. In Zechariah 12:10, we read, and I, God the Father is speaking, will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the Spirit, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they have pierced, the Son. They will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. A verse that many people have not even looked at in which you see the Trinity as clear as you can imagine in the Old Testament depicting the New Testament, the role of each. Okay, John, 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 what, what, let, let Lisa finish the last question that you brought up which was this, because we only got about 30 seconds now and that's this. What about this material that we are reading? I asked you that question and they said that it, it's, it's been lost. The Gospels, and well, so on. But, uh, Jesus, Jesus said, I have not spoken of myself, but God had given me a commandment of what I should say and what I should read. Yes, but what I want to know is the record of that, has it been lost? Yeah. He, was not, he was not speaking about the King James Version. I understand that. I'm asking exactly. Gleason, what about the original manuscripts? Well, have they been I lost? Think, I think it should be pointed out that we today still have manuscripts of the New Testament and the Old Testament that go back four, five, or even eight centuries before the Quran was revealed to, Mo to Muhammad. And they are identical, or virtually identical in wording, to what we have in our scholarly editions of the Old and New Testament today. Therefore, it <clears throat> is uh, contrary to reason to suppose that there was some other form of gospel or of uh, Old Testament or Torah which is different, for which there is not one line, one word of manuscript evidence. All right, we, we don't we're, have we're, a complete we're record of the of Jesus in his lifetime. All right, gentlemen, we're out of time, and I had three more questions to ask both sides, but we're going to have to pick it up again next week, and we're going to the topic of, is Muhammad a true prophet of God? And so I appreciate uh, all the information, and I hope that you'll join us next week. Thank you. glad that you joined us tonight and we are talking about the topic of Islam and Christianity. And we've come to our second topic. We have four wonderful guests with us tonight representing both sides and the topic tonight is Muhammad a true prophet of God. And during this series of programs we open up each half hour with uh, a five minute presentation by one of the representatives from each side. And to begin this half hour we're going to have Dr. Jamel Badawi talk about the evidence concerning is Muhammad a true prophet of God. You may begin. First of all, five basic points about prophethood because it's related. One, God is one. He cares for humanity and wishes good for them. Two, humanity is one. It needs guidance and searches for meaning and direction in life. Three, it follows that the essential divine guidance is one, in essence, to attain peace through submission to, obedience to, and love to God, which is the literal meaning of the term Islam, which we believe has been the faith and message of all of the prophets of God throughout history, the greatest of whom are Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad, may peace and blessing be upon them all. Four, those messengers were the best role models for mankind in faith, moral conduct, and leadership. It is an article of faith in Islam to believe in all of them, to love them, and to respect them. Five, all prophets were sent to their people, except for Prophet Muhammad, who is believed by Muslims to be chosen by God, to be sent to the entire mankind with the universal message. His message is the culmination of the essence of the all, all of the previous revelations. Now, why do Muslims accept Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as the messenger of God? Eight reasons. One, he did claim this, and there is absolutely no reason to belie his claim since he was acknowledged even by his enemies as a model of integrity and truthfulness. His nickname was Al-Amin, the trustworthy. Two, there is no ground to dismiss his claim as religious visions or hallucination, 
unless we dismiss all other revelations and prophets. Three, there is a clear absence of any ulterior motive on his part, not like today's prophets. He lived in a greater poverty and suffering as a result of fulfilling his prophetic mission. The simplicity and austerity of his life continued even after his victory over the pagan who sought to destroy him and to destroy Islam. And until his death, he lived in that simple life. Four, what he taught was consistent, we insist, with the core of the message of all prophets before him, to worship the one and only God of all and follow his guidance in our lives. It is inconceivable to say that all Jewish rabbis and prophets, one after the other, did not understand the language and did not pick the idea of triune godhood. Six, five, his life was the embodiment of his teaching and a comprehensive model for mankind under all circumstances, peace and war, all circumstances, and in all roles needed for reali realistic human life on earth. Six, his advent was accompanied by numerous extraordinary signs, one of which is the 100% accuracy of all prophecies that he made, and the Quran, which we'll discuss in a different topic later on. Seven, the fruits of following him sincerely not paying lip, at lip service like most Muslims do today, includes the total positive transformation of the lives of individuals and nations. In fact, there is a sheet out there that gives witnesses of many non-Muslim writers it's available outside. I have a few also with me. People who are not Muslims who make very glaring remark about the character and impact. One Jewish writer by the name of Hart, he said among the hundreds most influential personalities in human history, including prophets, number one was Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Finally, according to the Quran, the advent of his coming was prophesied in many scriptures, including the Bible. There is a brochure outside. I have more of that. The Bible speaks quite clearly about a prophet, a great one to come from the descent of Ishmael. The promise of blessing is not only limited to Isaac, it's also the descendants of Ishmael. The book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, speak about a prophet like unto Moses, not a son of God like unto Moses. Uh, Deuteronomy 33 speaks about Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad because it speaks about Sinai, Seir, which is in, Jer in, uh, in Palestine, and Paran, which is, according to the Bible, in chapter 21 of Genesis, is Mecca. Even the name Mecca or Bakka, which is an alternative name, appear in the 84th Psalm of David. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 21, verses 13 through 17, there is an amazing description of the migration of Prophet Muhammad from Mecca to Medina, and it connected with the tribe of Kedar, which is, according to the Bible, the descendants of Ishmael. John the Baptist, when he came, was interviewed by the Jews, as reported in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 19 through 27. And it was quite clear that the Jews expected three personalities. Asked him, are you the Christ? He said, no. Are you Elijah? He said, no. And then they asked it a third person. They expected, are you that prophet? And again, he said, no, that prophet is none but the prophet like unto Moses with a complete code of law. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank I'll you. take a check for the remaining seconds. <laughs> okay, two seconds, all right. Um, and uh, responding from the Christian side will be Dr. Anis Sharosh. And let me just say, as we begin this portion, that for both of our uh, teams on the platform, that uh, in Islam, as a Muslim, you are to be very honorable when you talk about Jesus. So to even disagree with a Christian, you have to be very careful. And I've told these men that they can have freedom and that we recognize when you question some of our beliefs that it's not going to be taken by us to be a disrespect on your part. But I hope that it'll go the other way as well, that when we talk about our views concerning Muhammad and the Quran and Allah and so on, that the questions that we would have they are questions and they are to, to hold no disrespect, but we do want to get to the truth question. So hopefully that will uh, put a little oil on the water here as we start out. And uh, Hanis, uh, you may begin. I greet you in the name of Jesus, the man from my hometown, my Lord and Savior. From Deuteronomy 18, I read from verse 21 and 22. And if you say in your heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. Muhammad never gave a prophecy 
in terms of matching the prophets of the Old Testament or even the apostles or Jesus our Lord. The most damaging thing about this whole matter is every Muslim every day and any time he testifies the kalima which states Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah meaning I testify there is no god but Allah and Muhammad is his what apostle not prophet in fact we read in surah 3 144 that Muhammad is but a messenger never is he a prophet and a messenger like the apostles were sent with a message but not a prophet who talked to God and God talked to him he never states that it was always the angel Gabriel something else of interest and that is what did he do for 15 years before he began to claim he saw these visions? And what new revelation did he give us that we do not have before already seen and depicted elsewhere? As for Moses, let me share with you what John, what Peter rather, declared on the day when he was preaching in the city of Jerusalem in chapter 4 of Acts verse 22. For Moses truly said to the fathers, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren him you shall hear in all things whatsoever he says to you and it shall come to pass that every soul who will not hear the prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among it from among the people yes and all the prophets from samuel and those who follow as many as have spoken have also foretold these days you are the sons of the prophet and of the covenant which god made with our father saying to abraham and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed and this terminology following these statements indicates that the prophet is indeed Jesus Christ and not Muhammad. Now we come to a very significant matter that's always brought up. And that is, if one is familiar with the term gospel, according to the Quran, he may wonder why in the world the word is never plural. Every knowledgeable individual knows that by the time Muhammad came, the canon of the Bible was established and the 66 books comprising it were a fact of life. Therefore we ask, why did Muhammad speak of the Gospels? Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Here is the astonishing discovery. Ladies and gentlemen, we discover that from historical documents that attest to the fact that Waraka bin Nufal, the uncle of Muhammad's first wife, Khadijah, had indeed translated a so-called Gospel of Matthew from Hebrew into Arabic. We know that this particular gospel did not include the divinity of Jesus, neither the trinity of God, because it was written by unbelieving Jews. We have pieces and particles copied in the Quran and other contemporary books which explain to you why Muhammad spoke only of the gospel of Jesus rather than the gospel of Jesus, reflecting the same idea because written by unbelieving Jews that Jesus was not son of God, there was no trinity, and so forth. Unfortunately, this gospel is extinct, but much like the Iliad, or other documents we have sufficient verses here and there to know such a book was in existence and came to muhammad's attention while preparing the quran over a period of 23 years and 15 years before that in preparation before the writing came sahih bukhara volume 1 page 298 and sahih muslim volume 1 page 7879 testify to this gospel's existence waraka bin nofal was the first and only man of wisdom khadijah sought for counsel when muhammad began to relate to her his suicide the tendencies and visions of Gabriel according to Asira al halabiya volume 1 page 155 and 363 and Asira and Makiya, volume 1, page 123 Waraka, get ready for a surprise was actually a Christian pastor who was it that encouraged Muhammad to marry Khadija and perform the wedding ceremony you know by now it was none other than Waraka the fact that the marriage was monogamous until Khadija's death identified as a Christian marriage. He never met anybody else till later when she died. Muhammad made regular visit with Waraka. Additionally, the old preacher, according to Ibn Hashim, volume 1, page 174, spent an entire month with Muhammad annually in the Hira Caves until Waraka died, where he later claimed he saw the vision of Gabriel. Chronologically, the dry spell of revelation corresponds precisely with Waraka's death until Muhammad was comforted and encouraged by his wife to continue the revelations. Thank you very much. All right, we're going to take a break and we'll come back and have our discussion with these men. Please stick with us. Please just, please just remain seated. <laughs> please remain seated. 
On the side or in front? Front. Okay. And we'll come out and we'll push there. Okay, stand by. In 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, No clapping, three, no clapping. 2, all right, we're back. And my first question is going to be to Dr. Hussein Morrissey. And what you said was that Muhammad was a prophet of God because he claimed to be. And before we actually start this section, let me say something to our television audience. Because we ask questions to both sides, truth claims about Jesus, about Muhammad, we understand that, uh, that these are uh, impactful words if you want. They can stir up controversy. But to get to the truth question, especially in America where it's pluralistic and everybody wants to ask the tough questions, I want you to feel a freedom to ask the tough questions about Jesus as well as about Muhammad. Next week we're going to talk about Jesus. So, and I know that under the Quran you are, have an imposition. You've been imposed upon not to say a lot of things in a negative manner, but we don't expect that. But we do want to at least bring up the questions concerning truth, and, and so let's do that. But let me ask this about Muhammad. Do we have anything besides Muhammad's own word that he was a prophet? What proof for a person that might be a skeptic? Well, first of all, John, I would strongly recommend to you to change the name of your show from the John Ankerberg Show to the Anish Rose Show. <laughs> Brother Anis is uh, very famous of his own private research, uh, and when we check his references, it turns out at the end to be a laughing matter for uh, theologians and for accuracy. Okay. Break First of all, I, I would like to answer your question now precisely. Okay. Prophecies, hundreds of prophecies in the Quran, open prophecies that could have went wrong, multiple prophecies that we can go through. Give us one. Just one. The uh, uh, victory of the Romans over the Persians in few years, at the time when the Roman Empire had been sacked more than a hundred years ago, and every indication was that it had been already destroyed, flat out in the Quran, that the Persians won over the Romans, and in few years, the Romans will win against the Persian, and it happened exactly six years later. What sir, what sir, what sir is that? 30. 30. Number 30. Read, read it for us. Well, I do not... I do the, not Adnal, the Romans have been defeated in the lower part of the land, and after they defeat, they will win again in a few years. In the Arabic language, few years means something between three to nine. And the reason for not specifying the exact date is that the military battles, as you know, can sometimes begin with one particular move or at the final end. But it did happen actually within that term, and there is another prophecy in the same surah also. Well, another thing that Brother uh, Anis uh, chose to ignore, multiple physical miracles that are attributed to Prophet Muhammad. However, the Muslims never make any big deal about it. They do not go around and saying Prophet Muhammad did such and such physical uh, miracle, because physical miracles become to be part of history, and some people believe it, some other people do not believe it. But the biggest miracle that Prophet Muhammad did bring to mankind, and it contains a challenge to mankind to examine it. 1400 years, the Quran, it says, if you are capable, or if any human be, uh, person is capable of coming up with something of similar material, they will never be able to. Millions have tried, none succeeded. And it is a miracle, a living miracle, that a Christian can examine, and I invite all of you and the audience and the viewers to examine it for yourself and judge for yourself, you will find it the biggest miracle that ever came to mankind. Let me ask you this. Does not the Quran say about Muhammad that he did no miracles seven different times? Yes, there were references in the Quran to miracles. For example, in Surah number 9 about the battle of Badr and the divine intervention in that battle, there are several mentioned and testified to in the Quran itself, yet some people misunderstood some statements in the Quran. What, 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 what do you do about the statements where it actually says that he did no miracles. No, no, I didn't say that. I didn't say he did not do miracles. No, I'm saying the Quran says that, so I'm saying if you say, have the Quran saying that he did no miracles, 
no, then the don't you have a contradiction when the Quran, the Quran never said that? The Quran never said that Prophet you, you Muhammad could? didn't do miracles. What the Quran said yeah. is that they say some of the unbelievers came to him just like they came, the Jews came to challenge Jesus, peace be upon him. They said, we will not believe in you until you make the, uh, the earth uh, bring springs, until the mountains are moved. And then it says, tell them, glory be to Allah, I am only a human messenger. And there have been instances when Jesus did not respond to any demand for miracle like push button, but it did not negate that he had miracles. It simply right. said that those people, even if you give miracles, they will not listen. All right, Gleason Archer, uh, you have two things on the board there. Well, I, I just want to find out whether we are to distrust the notes of Yusuf Ali. I've looked at this passage in Surah 30, and uh, what I see is the remarkable defeats of the Roman Empire under Heraclius, who was 7th century AD, and the straits to which it was reduced are reviewed in Appendix 10 to follow this surah. It was not merely isolated defeats. The Roman Empire lost most of its Asiatic territory and was hemmed in on all sides at its capital, Constantinople. The defeat in a land close by must refer to Syria and Palestine. Is that the I word of God? I don't see anything about Belgium. Is, that the, is, is that, that the word of God or word of Yusuf Ali? Yusuf oh, so Ali you're rejecting, a, a you're rejecting Yusuf Ali. You're, 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 yeah. <laughs> you don't, we're talking about the word of God, not the word of Yusuf Ali or Hassan Abdul Rahim and Ali Alewa. Well, well uh, find, me, and Arshar, find me the word for Belgium in here. Dr. Arshar claims that he speaks 27 languages, but he is now trying, trying to hide behind a commentary of a translator. I'm you not, can read I'm, the Arabic I'm text, not. translate it for us, Dr. Arshad. Now, okay. I'd like to ask both of them, what does the word bid'a sinin mean? Bid'a, in Arabic, how many in years? Arabic means somewhere between three to nine. Precisely. And the battle took place 12 years later. No. Yep. From, that's the record that um, we have. According no. to your record. Right. According, that's, to Gibbons, that's, that's according to Gibbons, that, the, the fall of the Roman Empire, it contradicts what you say. This is part of your own private Let me give well. you a very important well, point. Before here, you bring that up, let's ask yeah. the second question. Does the Quran, yes or no, say that Muhammad did no miracles? Nowhere. Nowhere, Nowhere. Nowhere does it say no that. Yeah. Nowhere. Okay, Nowhere does it say Nowhere does it say he performed any miracle. In fact, he told them that he was sent as a warner, as an apostle, as a messenger, does as not a teacher, it. but he never says that he was able to perform any miracle. It That's doesn't. why the Jews rejected him. When in the beginning they welcomed him into Medina, which was controlled by the Jews, and where he was a good friend with them, and later turned against them because they would not accept him as again, a messenger. Right. This research. does not negate. Yeah, that does not right. negate. That is right. a private research. Right. 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 In, in, your, in your talk, you mentioned the fact that uh, Muhammad was uh, predicted in the Bible to come. Yes. And in your writings, you have talked about the fact that he is the one that Jesus talked about when he said he would send the paraclete, the comforter. Yes. Uh, now, you quote John 14, so that must be one of those that's an accurate verse that has come down to us. Is that correct? With some reservation, because biblical scholars themselves say that many of the writers of the Gospels put interpretive statements in the middle. For example, well, John 14, 26 says that the Paracletus, which is the Holy Spirit, which is a matter of contradiction because the word Paracletus appears in the Gospel in four places. And it, in the translations of the Bible, it's quite misleading because one time it appears as comforter, one time it appears as mediator. Well, we're going to so ask the, with, ask with, the linguist with that in a minute. With, with that but, but I want to ask you, is, is, is John chapter 14, verse 25 and, and 26 an that's accurate what verse? Yeah. All right, now let's read the yeah. verse then. Yeah. Jesus says, but the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. Now, you're saying that's Muhammad. Yes. But Jesus goes on and says, and he will remind you, that's the apostles, of everything I have said to you. So the question is, how could, if that's Muhammad, did Muhammad tell the disciples 600 years before that time? Yes. I, I, I think you have to yes. go back a little bit, John, to chapter 16 also, in which he said, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, is to come? He will lead you to all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatever God will teach him, he will teach you. Yeah, Hussein, then, I just, I'm then just, how can God teach the Holy Spirit if the Holy Spirit well, is God? Well, what I'm asking you, Hussein, is the fact is Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would come and remind the apostles. Are you saying that Muhammad was present? Yes. 
the not address, the apostles. The address, yes. that is given, the address that is given to the prophet is meant to address all others. Just like Jesus was addressing his contemporaries and he says, you will see the son of man coming in the cloud. It does not necessarily mean those people in front of him. It could mean also generations. And Prophet Muhammad indeed reminded the followers of Jesus who were living in his time that this was the true teaching of Jesus and the Quran documented the fact that many of them had tears flowing from their eyes when the Prophet recited the truth about okay. Jesus to them. All right, now, but, wait, let me, let me get the linguist on the board here. Does paraclete mean all of those things in the Gospels? Parakletos means one who is called alongside to help. Right. All right. He was a helper. And, he was a helper. Uh, Comfort them. Yet well, the point is very clear in verse 26 that whoever it is is going to help the then living apostles who are sitting before Jesus and who are going to have the responsibility of recording the New Testament, that he will bring to their recollection what Jesus has said. Now that could not refer to something that happened in the seventh century AD. Let, let, me, let me remind you one thing about one thing, Dr. Arsha. Jesus said, I must go in order for the comforter to come. Right. All of us know that the Holy Spirit was present before Jesus, during the time of Jesus, and after Jesus. True. So Jesus made it conditional that I must go in order for the comforter to come. And he right. spoke on about the, on a the prophet, day. A, another comforter, just like himself, another not. prophet to the, come. But he spoke prophet, about the revelation not, not to come. Prophet. After Jesus, peace be upon him, not one single okay. prophet that came with a revelation other than Muhammad, right. let, no let, revelation that came but the Quran. Hussein, okay, we, so, got, a, we got a minute left. Shrosh, you got just one yes. minute. That's okay, it. here it is. The Pericletans' work was not to gather armies and gain victories with earthly weapons, but to convict men of sin, of righteousness and judgment. And that's what happened on the day of Pentecost. That's why 3,000 were saved instead of people being killed. His teaching was to glorify not himself, but Christ, and do the work of Christ sent him to do. According to if John it, If 16, it were true 14, that the Holy Spirit resolved all problems and gave all information in the day of the Pentecost, why is it that the disciples were still differing about who Jesus is and until now you have thousands of denominations? Exactly. Do we have thousands of denominations no, differing about we Jesus? We have also Hundreds. 150 denominations among the Muslims. This right. is not yes. a point of interest. Yes. <laughs> that's your private, that's, that's your right. private research. All right, private let's, uh, research. Let's, 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 let's We're going to pick it up next week and we're going to talk Just about Jesus. Just because you Jesus. don't know that doesn't mean that. Gentlemen, thank you for this week. Join us for next week and we're going to look at the evidence concerning Jesus. There's a clear-cut difference and I think you'll see it. I hope that you'll join us. I hope you'll apologize for our dull meeting. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Now, the next program, the next program, hello. Hello. Gleason, just get ready there, and we'll start with you to lead off this program on is Jesus Christ God or is he a prophet of God? Okay, stand by. We need applause on five. A little tighter, four. All right, uh, let's... Uh, Begin then, Gear, as soon as you count us down, and we will have clapping to start this uh, half hour program. All right, applause on four, and John, you will open on the camera on your left. Okay. All right, in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. Welcome. We are talking about Christianity and comparing Islam and Christianity in our debate during these weeks. And we have four uh, gentlemen that are doing an excellent job. And tonight we're going to continue. And our topic that we're continuing with tonight is a very controversial one. And to say right at the beginning, those that are representing Islam tonight are commanded in the Quran to give Jesus much respect. But I've asked them to ask the hard questions because they do not believe that Jesus claimed to be God, nor that he is God, that he was just a prophet. 
But even saying that brings controversy. We feel that it's not going to be any disrespect to talk that way any more than in this debate we're going to talk about Allah and Muhammad and ask hard questions that way. Hopefully we can do it. We're all friends here. Uh, the men on the platform have uh, spent quite a bit of time off the platform together and they're friends. But I want those of you at home to know that we're going to talk about some tough things, but we're going to try to do it in a friendly way. So to start, as we've been doing in the last weeks, we have five minutes from each side, and tonight Dr. Gleason Archer, representing Christianity, will talk, Did Jesus Ever Claim to Be God? In the first place, we ought to realize that the Bible teaches that Jesus was composed of two distinct natures in one person. He was the eternal God the Son, and he became, for our salvation, a true human being, taking unto himself a human nature in order that he might live the perfect life of the keeper of the law of God and the righteous standards of the Godhead, and then that he might offer himself as a substitute for our guilty life upon the cross of Calvary. Well, in the Old Testament, uh, Jesus, uh, Moses stood before God at the burning bush and asked, What is your name? God replied, The name by which I want to be remembered forever is the I Am, Ehye. In John 8, 40, 58, Jesus told the Jewish leaders that he was that very one, the I Am, when he said, Before Abraham was, I am. The Jewish leaders clearly understood Jesus was equating himself with God in Exodus 3.14, and so they picked up stones to kill him for blasphemy. On another occasion, Jesus said, unless you believe that I am, you shall die in your sins, John 8.24. In both of these passages, then, Jesus identifies himself with the same words that the Greek Septuagint used to identify God's name in the Old Testament. Jesus taught that to know him was to know God. Uh, in John 14, 9, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. So to see him was to see God. To believe in him was to believe in God. To receive him was to receive God. To hate him was to hate God. We find in Isaiah 48, 11, God stating, I will not give my glory unto another. But in John 17, 5, the high priestly prayer of Jesus, he prayed, Now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Of course, in Psalm 23, the scriptures say, The Lord, or Yahweh, is my shepherd. But Jesus in uh, John 10, 11 said, I am the good shepherd. In the Old Testament, God claimed that he will be the only one who will judge all the surrounding nations. Jesus in Matthew 25 claimed that he would be the judge of all men at the end of the world. When Jesus claimed that he was the Messiah, he was also claiming to be God. How do we know that? Because Isaiah 9, 6 calls the Messiah the mighty God, the Father of eternity. El Gibor Evi Al. And the term El Gibor, which occurs several times elsewhere in the Old Testament, unquestionably refers to Yahweh. Jesus' messianic claims are clearly seen when he was on trial for his life and was asked by the high priest, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus responded, yes, it is as you say. And I say to all of you, in the future you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. This was a direct reference to Daniel 7, 13 and 14, where the Son of Man approaches God, the Ancient of Days, and is given authority, glory, and power. 
over all nations and peoples. Men of every language will worship him. What did the apostles teach about Jesus? After all, it is one thing to claim your God. It's another thing to get other monotheistic Jews to believe it. But in uh, John 1, 3, the apostles said, Jesus was the one who created the universe. In Colossians 1, 16, Paul adds that at this moment, Jesus sustains the universe in existence by the power of his word. Jesus himself said in Matthew 28, all power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. In Titus 2.13, Paul calls Jesus our great God and Savior. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, and uh, representing Islam will be Dr. Hussein Morrissey, and you may begin right now. Thank you, John. I take refuge in God Almighty from Satan the despicable. And as I, as I stand here before you, I seek the protection, the guidance, and the mercy of the one and only God, the creator of heaven and the earth, the God of Adam, of Noah, of Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. To me as a Muslim, Jesus, may the peace, mercy, and blessings of God be with him, is not a stranger at all. Islam makes it a mandatory article of faith to believe in Jesus. In the Quran, Jesus described as a prophet from God, a messenger from God, a miracle from God, a sign from God, and mercy unto mankind. As a matter of fact, he is the only Messiah that is mentioned in the Quran. But the word Messiah does not mean God at all. To come to mankind as the only Messiah to come to mankind. His virgin birth and his miracles are well documented in the Quran. His mother, the Virgin Mary, is highly honored, highly respected by the Muslims, as the Quran explains that God had selected Mary, purified Mary, it shows Mary above women of all nations, above women of all times. The Quran also gives the proper and correct explanation of what is meant that Jesus is a word from God. You see, God Almighty creates by his free will, but he does not beget, he does not incarnate. The Old Testament, in black and white, in the book of Job, tell us, how then can man be justified with God? And how could he be holy that is born of a woman? Jesus was born of a woman. By the creative word of God, the word be, Jesus came to existence in the womb of Mary, miraculously, just like the creation of Adam. No father, no mother. Jesus devoted all his life to witness to the fact there is one and only one God. The same exact deity, the same exact God that was witnessed to by Adam, by Noah, by Abraham, by Moses, and by Muhammad. As a Muslim, I am also intrigued to read in the current versions of the Gospels that this how Jesus viewed himself, and how did he teach about himself. In the Gospel according to Matthew in chapter 6, when the disciple asked him, to whom shall we pray? He didn't say pray to me. He didn't say pray to the Trinity. He said you only pray to our Father who art in heaven. This is Islam. When asked about the day of judgment, he said, I don't know. The angels don't know. Only God knows. Jesus spoke of God Almighty as my father and your father, my God and your God. But the real and the crucial acid test came when he was asked, what is the first of all the commandments? He said, the first of all the commandments is here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Therefore you shall love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy spirit, and with all thy strength. This is Islam. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prostrated himself, fell to the ground, put his forehead on the ground, and he prayed to God. That is how Muslims pray to God. 
The core expression of faith in Islam is La ilaha illallah, no deity to be worshipped, but the creator of heaven and the earth, the one and the only God. Jesus, peace be upon him, not only taught, not only believed, but he practiced an identical doctrine. In black and white, in the book of John, chapter 7, verse 3, we are told that Jesus said, eternal life is to know the only true God, only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou have sent. As a Muslim, I'm assured that my belief in Jesus is not the byproduct of theologians, is not the byproduct of man-made theological doctrines or councils. As a Muslim, I am comforted and assured that my belief in Jesus is the correct belief, not only from the teachings of the Quran, not only from the teachings of Muhammad, but from the lips of Jesus, the man that is highly respected, highly honored, by the Muslims and by the Christians. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. When we, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we'll ask Dr. Gleason Archer to respond to that and give us the proof in the scripture that points to God taking on the form of a man. Stick with us. Please remain seated, if you would. You can stand up, but uh, stay in your place there. We're on the other side first, and uh, Gleason, uh, the statement has been made, and I'd like you to answer that question. Okay, John, we'll open up on the camera straight ahead of you. Very good. Okay, John, here we go. In five, four, three, two, all right, we're back, and uh, I hope that you're enjoying this discussion. We're talking about the comparison between Islam and Christianity concerning the person of Jesus Christ. Christianity claims that he claimed he was God and then gave proof that he was God by the resurrection. We're going to talk about the resurrection next week, but this week we're talking about the claims. And Islam says he did not claim to be God. He wasn't God. He was just a prophet, a revered prophet, but a prophet only. Now, Dr. Gleason Archer, uh, the question that has come from the other side is, what can you point to as evidence in the scripture that Almighty God took on the form of a man and was both God and man? Where does it say that in the scriptures? The passage that comes to my mind foremost is in Philippians chapter 2, where we read, beginning at verse 5, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed with the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped after, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is the only hope of the world. This is the only solution. How God could be just and the justifier of the ungodly. It had to be a substitute who could suffer the penalty in our place. And it had to be an adequate substitute because being God as well as man, he was a sacrifice of infinite value. Then, uh, uh, Anis, you had a point you wanted to bring up in that. Well, let's, let's let the other you, side answer you, that. And I would like I, to come to the other side and say okay. this. With the clear references that Gleason gave, he could give others, especially the Ego Me, which is a direct reference to Yahweh. Ad Adonai and Elohim were other words used for God that were applied to men in the Old Testament, but Yahweh, the I Am of Exodus 3, is never ever used of anybody but God. And Jesus took it to himself at least four times in John 8. What do you do with that clear 
cut reference if to I may add here to what you said John there are two kinds of I am in the Greek there is who own that means the existence and this is the one that you will find it in the Old Testament in which God Almighty referred to himself there is ego amy which means I am like I am tired and to make the point more clear John which is supposedly wrote the book of Revelation according to the Christians refers to uh, God Almighty the creator of heaven and earth God the Father if you wish by the word who own five times in the book of Revelation not one single time he refers to Jesus as who own so if John which is supposedly wrote the gospel according to John and wrote the book of Revelation wanted to make the point very clear he would have used the same terminology but they are not the same terminology they might sound the same in English but they are not the same in All Greek right, let's stay right on the issue yeah. true or false because Dr. Archer in your book you have said this is a direct reference to Yahweh in Exodus 3.14 and you say the language is clear John as he finds that in the Greek uh, testament May I remind you that Proverbs 30 verse 4 declares who has ascended into heaven or descended, who has gathered the wind in his fists, who has bound the waters in a garment, who has established all the ends of the earth. What is his name and what is his son's name if you know? The answer given by our Lord 10 centuries later is found in John 3.13. No one has ascended to heaven but he who came down from heaven, that is the son of man who is in heaven, God and only God can be in three dimensions. And this is a reference to Jesus okay. Christ. Don't load me up on too many. Hey, go right. Now, uh, in answer to the statement that we just heard about the book of Revelation, I read here in the Greek, Egoimi to alpha kai to o, lege curios hotheos. I am the alpha and the omega, says the Lord God. Ho'on kai ho'ein, Kai ho erchomenos ho pantokrator, he who is and who was and is to come, even the Almighty. And these words come from the risen Christ who appears in glory to John on the island of Patmos. So I'm afraid you're mistaken okay. about the book of Revelation. All right, so, let so me make one comment. point that yeah. since he said let I'm me, mistaken, me, and oh. then I will give it to <coughs> Dr. Jamal yeah. Badawi. I have oh. a comment. Uh, I, I have, that is more important. Yeah. Yeah. I have Just the, one quick thing. Yeah, yeah, I have the King James, the official King James version of the Bible in my hand here. Yes. I have the book of Revelation right here. Yes. And in the introduction of it, let me read for you under the author. Through the ages, some doubt have been cast upon the authenticity of this book. This is the reference that Dr. Archer, who is a professor of the Old Testament, is using and trying to convince us, oh, the Muslims, oh, okay, let me, let me, that let me, his references let me, let me, are accurate. Yeah, let me bring it up. You, you are the one that quoted Revelation to start with. Right. So the fact is, he's answering, but let's go back. Are you going to say that about the Gospels, which was most of this information, no, think, and the Old Testament as well? If I may, I just wanted right. to make a comment, I think, which applies to many other references that our Christian brethren keep referring to. What Dr. Archer read from Philippians is not the word of Jesus. It is an expression of the feeling of the writer himself. And I'd like to draw your attention to an issue of the Time magazine, 15 uh, of August of 88, in which they say the academics now, the scholars, say that the New Testament is a testimony of believing people. What they are saying is not history, but expression of belief in Jesus Christ. John Heck, in his classical volume, classic volume, uh, The Myth of God Incarnate, in paper after paper by the people of the Church of England, some clergy, some scholars, concluded the same thing. And in the introduction he says that the word used, that the disciples used to refer to Jesus, if they were the writers, actually is an ex poetic expression of their loving experience as they encountered Jesus, peace be upon him, and that it should not be taken literally. In the Bible there are places like Psalm 82 when people, human beings, are referred to as gods in an allegorical sense. But this is not a claim made on the tongue of Jesus. As far as the other claims, I draw your attention that there is an, uh, on the literature table, this pamphlet, see Jesus in the Bible and the Quran, all of these are answered, and I have additional copies of that. So we don't want to waste time in this. Even when you say, before Abraham, yeah, every but, human being existed in the knowledge of God before the earth was created. Yeah, okay, let me, let, me, let, me, let, me, <laughs> let me stop right here and hold us to the point. You have now quoted some liberal scholarship and the fact is, let me just give you one other liberal scholar talking about those liberal scholars. William F. Albright was probably the foremost biblical archaeologist in this country before he died. And he said, 
after he examined the evidence for the authenticity of the Gospels coming down from the apostles, from the eyewitnesses, and that we have originally basically what they said at that time, and we'll talk about these other materials, the church did not turn away from the book of Revelation. There's strong evidence for it. There were some that doubted, but those were turned down. But listen to what Albright says about those who speculate about the dates of the books on the evidence that we have today. He says this, only modern scholars who lack both historical method and perspective can spin such a web of speculation as that which critics have surrounded the gospel tradition. Bruce Metzger at Princeton said, the works of several ancient authors are preserved to us by the thinnest possible thread of transmission. In contrast with their figures, the textual critic of the New Testament is embarrassed by the wealth of his evidence. Now let's, let's, let's get down to what the evidence is. We've quoted liberal scholars. What I'd like to do is stick right on the verse of, I'd like to come, you and your book, Dr. Archer, have said that you think that Muhammad got close in terms of talking about Jesus, but he really missed the main essence. Why do you say that? Because Muhammad did not realize the necessity of a mediator between God and man. If God is to remain just and the justifier of the ungodly. You see, the problem in the uh, Quranic concept is that God can simply forgive anybody he pleases no matter what his crimes may have been. And all of the sanctions of the moral law can be disregarded. Well, suppose you had a judge like that in criminal court, and rapists and robbers and all kinds of uh, criminals should be brought before him, and uh, suppose the criminal said, well, um, yeah, I'm sorry I did it, and especially I'm sorry I got caught. Um, then the judge would say, well, that's all right then, I forgive you. No. That judge would be the most valuable ally that organized crime could possibly find in all of society. But Dr. Archer I'm, I'm, is... I'm saying that until you have an adequate punishment for sin, you are undermining and destroying the sanctity of the moral law. I respectfully take ex John. two exceptions oh, no, no, to what no, no, Dr. Let's Dr. Let them, let's said. let them answer. The question is, how can Allah be just, which you say that he is, and holy, but how can he be merciful mm -hmm. and just at the same time? How can a judge say, here, you've no broken problem. the law. But we will cover that as the uh, subject of salvation. We'll cover that in salvation, we but let me give a brief answer, answer well, just to satisfy you. Give right. me a brief Question. answer right now, if all you right. would. I'll answer you right now. No problem at all. No problem. First of all, I'd like to correct Dr. Archer respectfully. Nowhere in the Quran does it say whether you do good or bad, you will be forgiven. Nowhere. The Quran says, man ya'mal su an yujdabi. Whoever does evil, he will be rewarded accordingly. This is not true. To speak about the will of God as pervading is one thing, and to say that crime and no crime is to be rewarded the same is not a Quranic concept at all. I can produce you dozens of verses of the Quran, contrary to what Dr. Archer said. Okay, give me, uh, one, give me one no, final comment. That's not what no, no, I give, said. Right, we'll, we'll come back to that. Give me one final comment, because we're out of time here. Give me a final comment on what about this evidence where Jesus claimed he was God, it's in there. What about it? We don't believe that Jesus claimed to be God. Many scholars indicated that the words were put in the mouth of Jesus. Even the New Catholic Encyclopedia say this. The Jesus Seminar, of course, you don't agree with them because they are so-called liberal scholars. 80% of the words attributed to Jesus, they concluded, are not likely to have been said by Jesus. So there is a big dispute within the Christian community itself as to whether the word was put in the mouth right. of Jesus. Right. But your problem what? is, you say 40 times a day, Allahu Akbar, and your God is too small, to do what he wants to do. Why do you limit him? You say he's almighty, and the dilemma is this, he cannot become man. Very if certain. I'm your friend, I may write you Very in a certain. I may talk Bra to you, I may come to you. What's Brother the best? Shiroz. He comes in the person of a man. Brother What's Shiroz. wrong with that? Okay. Could may God God forgive you. Because he loves you. May God forgive you for because saying that God, God is all right. Lord. Gentlemen, what gentlemen, thank you for this week. <laughs> next week, <laughs> next week, we are turning your to God another. Is too small, that's the problem. <laughs> Please, you we are. We are turning next week to another controversial topic in the debate, and that is, did Jesus, was he actually crucified on the cross, as Christianity says, or was he not crucified, did he not die, did he not resurrect from the dead, as Islam says? So I hope that you'll join us. Now please, all of you just remain seated, and uh, while these fellows are getting unwired, I would like for you to know when we're going to show these programs. And 
If you would, there is an envelope that I would like for you to turn to right now, and let me make some. Okay, once again, John, you'll open up the camera on your left. All right. And I'll count you down if we could have applause at five. We'll start out on six. Um, gee, I don't know what else we'll do. Um, two, yeah, we'll do something like that. And then we'll come push it into one. Okay, here we go. In ten. Nine, eight, seven, six, five. Welcome to our program. We are having a debate between those representing Islam and those representing Orthodox Christianity. And we have come to that half hour where we're going to be talking about the topic, the crucifixion of Jesus, Christian and Muslim perspectives. The Quran states very clearly on the crucifixion of Jesus, and they said, Surah 4, 157, we killed Christ, Jesus, the son of Mary, the apostle of God, but they killed him not, nor crucified him. It was made to appear to them so, and those who differ therein are full of doubts, with no certain knowledge, but they follow only conjecture for a surety. They killed him not. So the Quran clearly teaches that Jesus never was put on the cross. When, cruci when Christ was not crucified, God made it appear to the Jews that someone was crucified. We'll talk about who that might be. And then finally, the words, God raised him up to himself, are taken to mean that Jesus was raised alive to heaven without dying. Christianity says just the opposite. And so on that, we will start with Dr. Gleason Archer, who will take the first five minutes to present the case from the Christian position, and then we'll have five minutes from the other side. You may begin right now. The Old Testament gives a very clear prediction of the crucifixion of the Lord in such passages as Isaiah 53, 5 and 6. Speaking of the servant of Yahweh, who is the Messiah, he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we were healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. But Yahweh laid on him the iniquity of us all. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living? Well, in the teaching of Jesus himself, as, for example, in the 16th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, where Peter makes the confession that Jesus of Nazareth is none other than the Messiah of God. And uh, Jesus commends him for it. Then he says, uh, beginning with verse 21, from that time Jesus Christ began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and be raised up on the third day. In uh, the passage that we quoted earlier in the second chapter of Philippians, you remember that it was stated that he was obedient even unto death, even death on the cross. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, we read, In him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. 
And it is interesting to observe that even the Unitarian professor of Harvard, Thayer, in his New Testament lexicon, states very plainly that the New Testament teaches that Jesus Christ is the same as essence and substance as God the Father. 22, 16, which we mentioned before, you have the statement, for dogs have encompassed me and they have pierced my hands and my feet. The verb kur or karu is being used there. This indicates a death by crucifixion, which at that time, that is back in the days of David, was uh, hardly practiced. And so it is a prophetic um, statement as to how Christ will die. In Zechariah 12.10, as uh, Brother Anis has mentioned, <clears throat> the Lord says, I will pour out upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication, so that they will look upon me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. And as was pointed out, me, quoted from Yahweh, is equated with him who is pierced on the cross. And then in Revelation 1.8, uh, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the first and the last. And then it says, I became dead, egonome necros, and behold, I am living, kai idudzone me, eis tu sionas tonayono, unto the ages of the ages. I think that it is one of the best substantiated facts in all history that Jesus of Nazareth was crucified by the government under the inspiration or the encouragement of the Jewish establishment. And therefore, it seems hardly <coughs> pertinent even to question it if we're going to value the testimony of history. Thank you. And our second speaker uh, representing Islam on the question, <clears throat> the crucifixion of Jesus, Christian and Muslim perspectives, uh, Dr. Jamel Bedoui. And uh, Jamel, go right ahead. The significance of crucifixion of Jesus in Christianity is not the same as in Islam. It is central in Christianity, but not in Islam for three reasons. One, Muslims are taught on the authority of the Quran to believe in love, respect, and honor Jesus, crucifixion or not, that belief will not change. Secondly, <clears throat> the Quran, even the Bible sometimes speak about prophets who were killed or dead persons who were resurrected to life without any implication of divinity. Three, Muslims do not believe in theories of original sin, necessity of bloodshed for remission of sin, or the necessity of the death of the divine in order to forgive the sins of his creatures. A second observation is that Muslims believe that Jesus was not crucified only on the authority of the Quran as John recited, which to them is the word of God. The only aspect about what he translated is that it could be translated, it was made to appear to them, or it could also be translated, it so appeared to them. Following is a Muslim response to four common grounds that are usually presented to substantiate the crucifixion of Jesus. The first, that the Old Testament prophesied crucifixion of Jesus in detail, including even his words on the cross. Two responses. <clears throat> One, according to Dennis Nineham and other scholars, Christian scholars, some of the Old Testament prophecies were taken out of context as they refer either to the general suffering of prophets like Isaiah or to specific events like the suffering of David at the hands of Amalekites in Psalm 22, it is in that context, according to Nineham, that David was mocked, scorned, and said, God, God, why have you forsaken me? I must note here that according to the Revised Standard Version of the Bible, 
the words they pierced my hand and feet did not appear in the ancient Hebrew manuscripts. A second response is that even if we were to take those Psalms as prophecies of crucifixion, and you read them in totality, not pick and choose, if you read them in totality, you will notice the following profile as summarized by a prominent scholar, Ahmed Abdul Wahab, based on Christian sources, that there was a conspiracy to kill a righteous servant of God, that they used somebody who's close to him and trusted by him to facilitate their job, that this servant prayed in great distress to God to save him, that God did respond and save him, and the conspiracy failed, and that the one who betrayed that righteous servant of God, as the Psalms express it, fell, fell in, the, in the hole or pit that he dug and got entangled in the net that he set for the righteous servant. In some Psalms even, like Psalm 91, it says that the way even that that servant was saved is by lifting up to heaven. A second ground, that it is said that all four Gospels speak about the crucifixion of Jesus. How could that be rejected? There are three responses to that. It is well known that many theologians and Christian historians do not agree on the authorship of the Gospels, whether the writers were eyewitnesses or not. John might call this liberal theologians, but there is an awful lot of them. Two, the Gospels were written after the fact with the view of proving theological position that were already taken before the Gospels were written. And as John Finton in his book about St. Matthew, he says Matthew in particular was obsessed to prove to the Jews that all prophecies in the Old Testament were fulfilled in Jesus. Thirdly, the Gospel accounts contain several irreconcilable contradictions and inconsistencies and many logical flaws. This is not the time to go in detail. And this casts doubt about what happened. And that led a Christian author, Adolf Harnack, in his book, uh, History of Dogma, to say, for example, that the empty tomb cannot be, cannot be taken as a historical fact. Actually, many scholars today believe that crucifixion is more of a statement of theology rather than history. The third ground. It is said that other writings like ancient Roman and Jewish uh, writings cr uh, confirmed the crucifixion. Many scholars, and I can give you reference to this, found out finally that many of these were forgeries attributed under pagan names. The best example is Josephus, who is a Jew and said to have said that Jesus was a Messiah and he came according to the pre prediction of the Old Testament. That is nothing but a statement of exception. Finally, some say crucifixion is necessary for salvation. We say no, not necessarily. This is a theological expediency that should not dictate historical facts. And the idea of dying and rising God is an idea that existed in mythology and legends before Christianity and was made to appeal to the Gentile world. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we're going to take a break. When we come back, we'll have our first response. And we're going to go to uh, Anish Sharosh. And I hope that you'll stick with us. All right, just remain seated where you're at. We'll quickly take the lecterns down, and we will uh, continue. Which camera gear? Okay. Okay, John, we come to you in five, four, three, two. All right, welcome. We're back, and uh, we want to come to uh, Dr. Anise Sharosh. And Anise, uh, the Christian Church throughout the world for 20 centuries has held a unanimous opinion on the crucifixion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. To this day, there is no dispute among Christians what happened to Jesus. We all believe he was crucified for our sins and raised for our salvation. Why? What are the reasons for this? Even the Greek Orthodox, Roman Catholic, Protestants, all of us agree on those points. What evidence has brought this consensus? What unambiguous testimony can you give that would bring all Christians of all stripes and flavors together on this point? The virgin birth, the pure life of Jesus, his death and resurrection, the empty tomb. The tomb of everybody else is still there with their bones or what's left of them. Jesus himself declared in Luke 9:22, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. 
in John 3, 14 to 16. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he sacrificed his only Son, that anyone believing in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Why is it that I, as an intelligent human being, would take the word of a man who comes after the fact by six centuries, when there are eyewitnesses, 500 of them who watched him as he ascended into heaven, and the record of the scripture of all the gospels, almost one-fourth of each gospel details the last week of Jesus, his suffering, his death, and his resurrection. Why should I take the word of a man? Going to the Quran itself, we are amazed at this terminology. We read from Mary Surah Mary, number 19, verse 33, And we, that means peace on me the day I was born, and the day I die, and the day I shall be raised alive. And I ask you a question. Here are three distinct days. The day I was born, he was born. Why did he say these words? He spoke these words when he was in the cradle. He had not died. He had not been raised again. So why jump and say he did not die? And another interesting thing is God would be a deceiver to have put somebody else in his place and made him look like them. Yet I believe that even the Quran has in it captivating the truth, which is when he was made like unto them, it is similar to that passage in the second chapter of Philippians, where Jesus takes the form of a man. He is like unto us. He takes our sin. He takes our place. He atones for us. And on the cross, he dies as a full payment for sin, because the necessity of the cross is such that without the cross, there is no salvation. Amen. I'd like to make a, right, a correction to what uh, Dr. Shirush said in his reference to the Quran. When the Quran speaks about the birth of Jesus, it's clear. About his death, it must be understood in the context of what the Prophet taught, that Jesus is coming again, and that after his coming, he will die and be buried. So the day that I die means after my second coming. That's what and you the say. day I resurrect means the day when Jesus and all humanity were resurrected to face accountability before God. Secondly, there is no deception on the part of God, if it is true, but this is not in the Quran, it's one interpretation. If it is true that Shubbiha Lahum, or it so appeared to them, means that Judas the Iscariot was put in his place and God changed his face and language or speech to look like Jesus, it is a just punishment for a betrayal. Is, is the, the is, most, wait, wait, wait. Is that what you are suggesting, that Judas was the one that was put I am, in his I'm place? I'm being very careful and honest by saying the Quran does not say that, but some interpretation what is to the What evidence effect. would you give to support that view? The evidence for the Muslim is the Quran, is the word of God, that's it. And but it doesn't say that in the Quran, does it? The, I'll give you more evidence. Well, wait, 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 you said the evidence is not in the Quran, and then you cited the Quran. So what is the, the evidence? evidence? is about what? You said, where did you get the idea? And what evidence supports that yes, Judas was the, the one that was substituted? The, exactly. The phraseology of the Quran simply says, it so appeared to them. Some interpreters, maybe they had access to whatever stories were circulating. I'll answer that question. I may give you some resolution to that puzzle. Don't say you? that this, in all likelihood, was Judas, but that's not what the Quran says. All, right, let, let, all right, let's let's suppose that we take your theory. What does that say about God? Didn't he deceive the people that were no, there? No. He if didn't? that interpretation, they just is, thought that, and he was the one that did that. If that interpretation is correct, it is a just punishment for an atrocious person who betrayed Jesus. And you people think that Muslims invented this idea that Jesus was not crucified. Go and read the introduction to the translation of the Quran by a Christian missionary, British, George Sale, in which he says it is wrong for the Christian world to think that Muslim alone believe this, and he gives the name of seven early Christian sects who believe that Jesus was not crucified. Right. I have here a copy of the Najah Hamadi Library, the Gospel of Thomas that was discovered in Egypt in the 1940s, in which Jesus say he was watching the crucifixion, and that out of their folly and blindedness, they nailed their own man. And that was discovered only yes. in the 1940s. Are, okay, well, let's, let's hold on and get a response. There are lots of false documents that have claimed a lot of things, but that doesn't prove that they're evidence. According the main to the document, Time magazine, it is well, not false. All right, all right, in the article in 86, it said that many scholars who suspected Thomas now believe that it is more ancient and more authoritative than the first. No, we'd have to talk it's about what, what scholars. Rudolf Bultmann once said that he thought that the New Testament, specifically the Gospel of John, was a second century Gnostic book. Now the problem was, is they sometime later found a fragment of the Gospel of John dating around the year 117 to 130. 
And it's very difficult for the Apostle John to be influenced by second century Gnosticism when his book was already written. But what you say, John, supports the verse in the Quran that those who make this claim, they have no certain knowledge, they are full of doubt. Yes. These are Christian scholars that are arguing back and forth. Well, and this is the Nag Hammadi well, Library. So actually, it is not a Muslim Christian debate, yes. it is actually a Christian Christian debate. Well, let's, let's talk about that because we're not talking, uh, Anis, we're not talking about the Gospel of Thomas. We're talking about solid evidence yes. that scholars have grappled with and that we have in our hands. Tell us about that evidence and why you can't just bypass it and come up with these, with these theories that aren't based on anything. Let me give you this from Surah Al-Ma'idah, chapter 5, verse 116 to 117, where the statement comes. I was a witness of them while I dwelt among them, and when thou tookest me, and the word here tookest me, is to a fatani, and it really means you have caused me to die. And that is the truth. When you have caused me to die after that death, then Jesus went up to heaven. The question I have for them is, why in the world would Jesus come to earth if he is going to be just another prophet? He came with the purpose that I, he explained that to the disciples, he lived with that in mind, he talked to them about it, and then he arose the third day, just like he said. So why should I take the word of a man, which is mentioned two, three times, when I have a whole rostrum of evidence that is far in excess of time and space, as far as 600 years earlier, and more volume to that truth. The answer is simple. If Dr. Shurush is aware of the intricacies of the Arabic language, he would have known that the word tawafaytani in Arabic has a broad meaning, which is the original meaning, which means fulfilled my term. And that it is used as an allegory for death, only as an allegorical meaning, and the rule in the Arabic language that the word should be used in the original meaning unless there is evidence to use it in the allegorical meaning. Now, if I agree... Even if we take that second assumption as true, even if we were to take it some of the interpretation that God took Jesus somewhere else and that raised him unto himself. The Quran doesn't say raised him alive. That there's also another interpretation that raised his soul. So in either interpretation, still, it is a matter of the usage of the Arabic language. But you have to go with one I, of those interpretations and uh, we need evidence for any interpretation. Okay, I have, I, I, well, I, I, let's I have let's get a response from the other side. And I, 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 have I commend the Muslims for respecting my savior so much. But they missed the point of why did he come to earth. Another interesting part is found in the family of Imran, chapter 3, verse 55, where that word is called Allahu, Allahu Isa, inni mutawafika. Here now, the same word, mutawafika. Listen to it. And remember when Allah said, O Jesus, lo, I am gathering thee. In this passage, they say gathering thee. In this other passage, is as I'm causing thee to die. And the question is, if that word means death, then it means death. Jesus died for our sins, he arose from the grave, and he's coming again. The question I would like to ask him is, why in the world is he coming again? Why is he going to, where do you get the interpretation he's going to die, be buried by uh, Muhammad in, the, in Medina, beside I, the grave? Where I, do you get that information? Have I have it's all made up. I have some evidence here from the New Testament, okay? From the New Testament itself, from the book of Luke in chapter 24, and I want the audience to be the judge of what it means. This is a story when Jesus went to meet his disciples, supposedly after his crucifixion. And he entered the upper chamber, and the disciples were terrified, for they supposed to have seen a spirit. Right. They thought that they have seen a resurrected body. Jesus said to them, why are you terrified? And why bad thoughts come through your heart? Right. Come and touch me and handle me and see for yourself. For a spirit does not have flesh and bone as you see me have. Right. Therefore, he is proving to them that he is still alive. He did not die on the cross. Then, to show the point, I know that this comes to you as a disappointment, but you can read it for yourself. I think we're missing. <laughs> right, let's, get a, let's get a response to that because there is quite a response. We we're only got two. the main issue that Dr. Shurush raised. Well, but let, let, let's get a response on that because. Yeah. Uh, one of the people that was there was uh, Peter. In Second Peter, he says, "We did not follow cleverly devised tales." Tales, exactly. Now let's let's uh, talk about uh, that Therese. whole thing of when Jesus appeared. Uh, is that what you would come to from the evidence, Doctor Archer? No, and uh, please uh, bear in mind that we know very well how Judas died. It, it, he yes. died as a suicide, and. Um, is no possibility of connecting him with the cross. That is right. the corniest theory that you could possibly imagine. That's right. Mm -hmm. 
Right. Now, the point, of course, is that Jesus uh, appeared to them showing that he had risen from the dead and that he had his resurrection body and uh, therefore he had overcome the, uh, uh, the curse that had come upon the human race because he had paid the penalty in full himself and he'd risen victorious from the grave. Dr. Archer just contradicted another part of the New Testament. All right, let's, 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 let's pick that up next week. We're out yeah. of time for this week. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> what we're going to do is we're yeah. moving on to the next one, which is the Bible and the Quran. <laughs> which book is the Word of God? And we're going to have the different uh, positions and the evidence presented next week. I hope that you'll join us. Thank you. <laughs> All right, our first speaker uh, on this next one will be uh, Dr. Jamel uh, Bedoui. And then our second speaker will be Anish Sharosh. Again, the Bible and the Quran. Which book is the Word of God? In 1 Corinthians, blood and flesh. Blood All right, just remain seated. We'll get to this one right away. I think you have a lot of questions out there. There was no blood in it. He said, come see me. He talks about... And we will.